Welcome to the Parsha Pairings with Jeff and Sherry. I'm Jeff Friedlander. And I'm Sherry, and we're so glad you've joined us today. We want to encourage you to be sure to subscribe to our channel. Click the bell uh, that will notify you every time we upload a new video. And if you are enjoying the video and you've got something out of it, please do like and share. And we value your comments in the comments as well. Absolutely. We'd love to see a lot more comments. Tell us what you're thinking, what you're getting out of it, and send it out to the world. This week's Parsha is called Shalak Lecha, and it means to send for yourselves comes out of Numbers chapter 13, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 41. The Haftor this week is Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 24. And the Brit Kadashah, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7 through chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 13 is where we're going to begin today, and we're going to do this whole video around 13. We're going to be releasing some other videos on the other chapters, so I want to encourage you just to read each of the chapters in this week's Parsha, the Torah, the Hof Torah, the New Testament, kind of connect some dots for yourself. So far, what we've seen is B'nai Yisrael in the book of Numbers. Uh, we've watched them, how they've observed and been miraculously delivered out of Egypt. We've seen the miracle provisions of the manna and the water in the desert. We've seen water out of a rock and bitter water turned to sweet. We've watched them get to Mount Sinai where they've ratified the covenant with Adonai. We've seen that marriage ceremony we talked about in previous videos. And they've received the Torah. They've received instructions. They've received the tabernacle instructions. They've built this. We're about 13 months into their journey out of Egypt now. And they are a range. They've got a kind of a military setup that we've talked about in previous videos. And they're ready to start moving forward. And yet, we've also watched them continue to complain. They've mm -hmm. complained about their provisions. They've complained about uh, Adonai and rejecting them and what's going to happen. They've talked about plagues and death and, oh, we'd rather be back in Egypt and all of that. And in last week's Parsha, at the end of it, we saw that Mo Adonai gave to... Uh, Moses, the, he had had the Ruach in him, the Spirit of God was in Moses, and it says that he takes the Spirit and he gives some of that Spirit to the 70 elders that joined him on the mountain, and then the two elders that <laughs> didn't join him on the mountain, they received it as well, and they prophesied, but it says they just did it this one time, didn't do it again. So now we are at the end of this piece here. We ended last week with the camp waiting for Miriam's seven days of purification to end because of her outburst of anger towards Moshe. And so we open up in chapter 13, getting into the next steps of getting this group of people into the promised land. Sherry, let's so kick prior, in. So prior to jumping right into 13, um, an interesting thing we need to note from the end of last week's Parsha is it tells us afterwards, after Miriam's seven days of purification, the people left Hazarot and encamped in the wilderness of Paran. What's interesting about this is this wilderness of Paran is literally on the border of the promised land. Mm -hmm. So they're right there at the yeah. promised land. It's as if God has said, I've taken you out 13 months. I'm ready to let you yeah. go in. So they're there. And we're going to learn some interesting information <laughs> about this place that they are mm -hmm. and what happens here and why they end up not getting into the promised land yeah. quite yet, even though they're literally right there just down the street so verse 13 chapter 13 verse 1 begins with adonai spoke to moses saying send some men on your behalf to investigate the land of canaan which i am giving to b'nai israel each man you are to send will be a prince of the tribe of his fathers a man from each of the tribe these are those leaders of the tribes so according to the word of adonai moses sent them from the wilderness of paran and uh, all the men who were princes of B'nai Yisrael. So we see here God, first of all, is continuing to operate in kingdom order. Yeah. He's not just willy-nilly sending people. It's the leaders that he's saying, choose your 12 leaders, you know, your 12 leaders that are over these tribes. Y'all are going to go and investigate the land um, that currently is occupied by the Canaanites. Right, it's seven Canaanite tribes throughout that are occupying it. Right, and so they're all, this is the promise, though, that goes all the way back to Abraham. Right. They are about, they're right there on the precipice of receiving yeah. this that's been promised for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is the goal. 
Mm-hmm. Of this grand deliverance out of Egypt yeah. is this land this right is it. here. It's where we've been once, where we've heard about our whole lives. But what we're going to see in this, many of us are familiar with this story, but what we're going to see is just still the blindedness that they mm-hmm. have of this slavery mentality. Yeah. They cannot seem to get past this slavery mentality into divine vision. Yes. They still only see in the, the carnal world and in yeah. the natural world. So we have these 12 tribes, tribal leaders that are going in to spy out the land. But we're only going to focus on the two heroes of the story. And chapter 13, verse 6 tells us we have from the tribe of Judah, we've got Caleb, the son of Jephthah. And then verse 8 tells us from the tribe of Ephraim, we have Hosea, the son of Nun. So we want to really kind of talk about who is Caleb and who is Hoshea? So we'll start with a bigger picture. We'll back up a little bit to a few of the other teachings we've done in the other videos. Where did these two tribes come from? you got a tribe of Judah, you got a tribe of Ephraim. Well, the tribe of Ephraim was founded by, it was Jacob's grandson, Ephraim. Joseph married an Egyptian princess. They have two children, Manasseh and Ephraim. Ephraim gets promoted by Jacob at a blessing, and he becomes the firstborn. This tribe now, Ephraimites, will eventually win the kingdom, which is the kingdom of Israel. When eventually that nation splits into two nations, you'll have a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom will be comprised of ten tribes. Those ten tribes will be called throughout the scriptures the Ephraimites or Ephraim. Uh, it will also be called Israel. Yeah, interchangeably the you'll hear You'll that. hear it is Israel. So that's ten tribes to the north. The southern tribe will be called Judah, or the kingdom of Judah. And that southern group comes from, as we see here, you got Hosea was from, Hosea was from the Ephraimites, the northern. Caleb comes from that southern kingdom, Judah. And Judah will eventually be the tribe known as the tribe of the kings. King David will come from there. Mm -hmm. Certainly 14 generations later, we will know that Yeshua, the son of God, son of man, the Mashiach, will come as that revelation tells us that he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So we have both this. Now, interestingly, Sherry, the Ephraimites, this group that Hoshea comes from, the son of Nun, this group of Ephraimites will eventually be, this ten tribes will be, captured by Assyria, and they will be sent out to 120 provinces, and those 120 provinces will be dispersed throughout the nations. And so Israel is dispersed throughout the nations. Judah, or the Jews, will be located geographically in the promised land and still there even to this day at this point. So you have what is so interesting. In hindsight, we get to look back and see this, They have no idea of Ephraim and Judah and the significance of these two men, Joshua, who's coming from one tribe, Ephraim, and Caleb, who's coming from the other tribe, Judah. They have no idea the significance of those two tribes going forward and how important the unity of those two tribes will be in the end of days. When we come back together and God says there's an olive tree and we're putting it all back right. together as one, Jeremiah 31 for you, and I'm not going to tell you, go read it. Jeremiah 31, the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Judah, uh, there's a promise there. Right. So I would encourage you to read Jeremiah 31. Sherry, tell us a little bit about Josh. Uh, well, uh, do you want to hit a little bit more about Caleb? Just his, Let's his talk history, a little more a little about, more about, about who Caleb is. Cause personally, his, and then we'll talk about His Joshua. prophecy going forward of what Caleb does in the land is really So Caleb's a pretty interesting guy. Uh, he, he does quite a bit. He, he's obviously a spy. He goes in and spies out the land. He also... Is one, he's one of the two that is the hero because he is a positive, he's a warrior, he's a fighter. But the land that he actually settles when they get into the promised land 40 years later is the land that is called uh, Hebron. Now Hebron is to the south, and interestingly he drives out the three sons of Anak. Now, these three sons of Anak, we're actually going to talk about them in a few minutes mm-hmm. uh, or in a, a future video because yeah. this is the Nephilim. And a lot of people have questions about the Nephilim. Well, when Caleb goes into the land in 40 years, it's these Nephilim right. that he actually deals with and, and gets rid of. Hebron also is a very special city. It will prophetically, it will eventually become the Levitical city of refuge. Mm. For in Leviticus, it talks about build a city of refuge. That will be Hebron. Historically, 
Hebron was pretty powerful because in Hebron, that is where Abram was renamed Abraham. That so it's is got also, past history yeah, and future history. It's also where Abraham was when the angel of the Lord came and prophesied, mm -hmm. in one year you will become, uh, your wife will become pregnant wow. with the son of promise, Isaac. So this land of Hebron, this is pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. Now, remember, Caleb is a of the tribe of Judah, the tribe of the kings, the tribe that the Messiah will come from, and it is the place where Abram was first given the promise of the promised land. Wow. It's the place where all of this took uh, uh, geographically happened, and pretty cool from there also, it's also the place where David actually was crowned king, and it's where the first capital was until Jerusalem was taken wow. for David. So this land where Caleb is going to end up, is a pretty prophetically past mm -hmm. history and future history very powerful place. All right, Sherry, let's find out. Joshua gets a new name here. So Shia, but he gets a new name, so that I makes was him very. Say, uh, maybe uh, some people may read this and go, "Who is Hoshia? Yeah, and why does he? What book does he have named after? Yeah. Well, it's the English is. Uh, we're going to see what happens. Hoshia in Hebrew means salvation. Yeah, and this isn't a noun. So this is. It's not a verb. This is a noun. By changing his name, we see that Moses changed his name in verse 16. Um, I'm sorry, verse 15, Moses changes his name, and he calls him now Yehoshia. Yeah. And by adding that Yud into his name, it now becomes God is my salvation. Mm. So he changes his name from just salvation to God is my salvation. Now, here's what's interesting. It also tells us that Hoshea, Joshua, is the son of Nun. Now his father's name, Nun, in Hebrew means perpetuity. Or it comes from a word that means continuous or eternity. Yeah. So a little fun Hebrew word play here. We've got uh, Yehoshua, Yehoshua, who is the uh, God is my salvation, comes from the son of Nun, who is eternity. We could say salvation... Hoshea is the son of eternity that becomes our salvation. What a prophetic word in his name. And salvation, wow. as we learn in the book of Joshua, Joshua leads them into the promised land. Salvation is what leads us into the promised land. And the Hebrew word for salvation throughout the scriptures is Yeshua. Yeshua. So we <laughs> see right here this story of God so yeah. beautifully woven together yeah. in these names and in this prophetic telling of just even this going in to spy out yeah. the land. We see so much of God's also, story Also, that here. name change was so powerful because as, as you, you pointed out, it was a noun, Hoshea, just mm -hmm. a noun of a person, place, or thing, right? A noun. Mm -hmm. But it became a verb. Mm. It became action. God is my God salvation. God is doing something. That's right. So, a powerful truth here. So we go on to see an interesting thing that how God sends them into the land. He tells them to go up through the Negev. He tells them to look at the cities, see where everything, you know, kind of get a landscape yeah. and see where you are. Now, in hindsight, you might be thinking, is this a cruel trick by God? Mm. I mean, doesn't he know the weakness of their heart? Doesn't he know that they're not going to be, yeah. they're going to shrink back and, and why would God do this? Well, we have to weave in the narrative given to us in Deuteronomy. Mm. Um, because Deuteronomy is kind of the cliff notes. Yeah. It's written at the end of their journey. It's just before, like the last 30 days or so before they go into the yeah, promised land. it brings it all land. together. And Deuteronomy, Moses recounts this story, but it adds a little more light into mm -hmm. what we're looking here at here in Numbers. So if we go back to Deuteronomy chapter 1, uh, verses nine, beginning in verse 19, Moses records, Then we journeyed from Horeb and went through all that great and terrible wilderness that you saw on the way to the hill country of the Amorites, as Adonai our God commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea. As I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which Adonai our God is giving to us. See, Adonai your God has set the land before you. Go take possession of it, as Adonai, your God of your forefathers, has promised you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Wait a minute. So we read in Numbers that they're in this land and he's sending them to spy out. But Moses is recounting that here's the land. Go take it. Go take it. Yeah, this, this is, is the it. promise. Don't be afraid. Moses encourages them to not be afraid. 
But they had a different response. (laughs) Verse 22 tells us, Then all of you came near to me. Let's send men ahead of us to explore the land for us and bring us back a word about the way we should go to the cities we shall enter. Mm. Now, what's interesting about this is that the people are coming and saying, we're not ready to do that. Let's just go check it out. Let's see what's going on. You know, this last 13 months has been kind of rough. We've had some surprises. Let's go see what this promised land is all about. Numbers doesn't give us that indication. As a matter of fact, Numbers, it seems as if God just speaks and says, go and do this. Right. But what we learn by overlaying the Deuteronomy account is that they come and they ask, and then Moses apparently goes before the Lord and says, what do I do? Yeah. I mean, I've told, here's the land. What do I do with them? Our numbers, our numbers story picks up with, and Adonai says to yes. them, he gives the command to go. So God is not tricking them. Yeah. He's not, if we only look at the numbers account, it seems unfair of God to do that. But he's giving a response to their stubborn hearts and their slavery and minded. Moses asked the permission. He says, look, it seems yeah. like a good idea. This is not a bad plan. We are going to take a right. million and a half people in here. Right. Why don't we send 12 ahead of them just to kind of get a feel for the land? And those 12 will respond back to their tribes. Mm-hmm. And so now we'll have a, a good communication land. Right. Here. I mean, this it's not a bad idea necessarily. Right. And God is reasonable in that and says, okay, that's fine. Which I think is a powerful truth for us. Sometimes we need to pray and talk to God because we can present our request to God with thanksgiving in our heart, the writer of Philippians says, and sometimes receive a good answer there. So Deuteronomy continues to shed some light on our our numbers narrative. Uh, It says in verse 24, They turned and they went up to the hill country. They came to the Wadi Eshkol and spied it out. They took into their hands some of the fruit of the land and brought it down to us. They also brought back word to us saying, Good is the land that Adonai our God. God is giving us. Mm-hmm. When we come back into our Parsha in Numbers 13, we see the fruits that they bring, the large grapes, the mm-hmm. all the pomegranates, all these large, amazing fruits they bring back out of the land. Um, now, let's juxtapose that against last week's Parsha. They're whining. Where's all the fruits and vegetables we had in Egypt? We're so, you know, what did you bring us out here for? Now God's carried him up, and now they're bringing back this harvest, and they're still afraid. It's as if they cannot get out of this slave mentality. They cannot seem to have supernatural vision to be satisfied where they are and understand that their cry for the what they had in Egypt yeah. under slavery, God is now wanting to give it to them in a the land of freedom. So, so let me ask you a question, Sherry, that I'm thinking of as we're doing this, this Parsha right here. In our lives, mine and yours, others, mm-hmm. have we found ourselves in places where a past experience or history seems difficult to get over? Mm. Sure. Right? I mean, we've... We've found ourselves like that. Sherry and I have had experiences yeah. like that. We've we found ourselves like that. And the Israelites, they were in a traumatic situation of slavery. And then they went through the, yeah, the deliverance, but man. Yeah. Frogs and boils and, you know, blood and death and all these things. And as they come out here, it is hard for them to release that fear. Yeah. They're afraid. And they're walking in that fear. They shouldn't. Right. They should be in faith right now. But I know in my life, I think you would say the same for yours and sure. ours, there are times when we just we have to walk in faith without fear, but fear uh, does grasp, grip us sometimes. Yeah. And there, There's an old, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Acronym. acronym. Yeah, the old acronym, right? Mm. False evidence appearing real. Right. Fear. It, it, the land looks great. But yeah. there's all these big things. We can, obstacles. The obstacles. Yeah. All they saw were the obstacles. As a matter of fact, verse 26 of chapter 13 really shows us that it wasn't just the deliverance out of the natural bondage. God was looking to their hearts. And verse 26 tells us that yet you would not go up. I'm sorry, Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 1, 26 says, Yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of Adonai, your God. They refused to go and take the promise. They refused to go and take the land. And what is this? So this word rebelled, they rebelled. It's the Hebrew word marar. Mm -hmm. Now, we've seen this word before. Yeah. 
This is that root word of bitterness, yeah. provoke and rebel. rebel. Yeah. They have had this problem of bitterness from the beginning. Yeah. We've seen God take the waters that were bitter and make it sweet for them. Yeah. But we've also seen that they complained and grumbled and they lived in bitterness of what they did not have. So their bitterness that's in the soul, in their soul that is just poisoning them, they need that touch of God like he did at the, the bitter waters. They're yeah. not allowing God to touch their heart to bring it into sweetness, sweet rivers yeah. of flowing water, and it's keeping them from the promises of yeah. God. And this is a great lesson for us about what does... What does rebellion look like? It's a product of the bitternesses mm. that we store up in our heart of, mm. I'm not satisfied with you, God. I'm not satisfied with what you've given me or not given me. Right. Your supernatural provision yeah. is not enough. I liked what I had in slavery. Yeah. And we've, we can watch through these children of Israel, we can watch what happens and how devastating it is yeah. to our own lives if we're not walking in that place of allowing the touch of mm. God. And, you know, when we, when we look at that story of the waters of Marar, the, the bitter waters, he put that wood into it. And isn't it that, that wood of the tree that our Messiah hangs on thousands mm. of years later that brings the healing to our hearts mm. of our bitternesses that we need to just apply to our own lives? Yeah, so true. So in Deuteronomy... He goes He's going to yeah. go on and reveal in verse 27. He says, In your tents you grumbled and said, Because Adonai hates us. They've even convinced themselves that Adonai actually, that the God who delivered them from Egypt literally 13, 14, 15 months earlier now actually hates them. They cannot understand right? how good he is. He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going? Our brothers have discouraged our hearts, saying the people are greater and taller than we are. <laughs> The cities are great and fortified up to the heavens. Besides, we have even seen the children of Anakim there. Now, children of Anakim is what is referred to as the Nephilim. And in another video, we're going to do a short little thing on the Nephilim to give you a picture of that. But in verse 29, he says, Then I said to you, Don't tremble. Don't be afraid of them. Adonai, your God, who goes before you, he himself will fight for you, just as he did for you in Egypt before your own eyes. Moses is doing the teaching that all of us would do. Right. Hey, don't you remember? Right. Egypt was bigger than you too. You were slaves for goodness sakes right. and God fought for you. God will fight for you here. In the wilderness where you saw how Adonai, carried God, uh, your God, Adonai your God carried you as a man carries his son. Everywhere you went until you came to this place. Verse 32. Yet for all this you did not trust in Adonai your God, the one who goes before you on the way to scout out a place for you to camp and to show you the way you should go, in fire by night and in the cloud by day. So Moses here is recognizing that it's Yehovah, it's the Lord himself who is the Lord of the battle, right? And I think it's great, this, this again, this word play. Moses lets them know, God has already gone before you and scouted out the land. Yeah. He's already called it good. Yeah. He's already spied Come it into, out. <laughs> what do we learn from this? Yeah. Come into agreement with what God calls good. Amen. When God Amen. says your circumstance is good and his provision is good, be in agreement with that and not yeah. in disagreement. And if we bounce back into our Parsha in yeah. Numbers 13... We see in verse 30 that Caleb quieted the people before Moses. So somewhere in this transaction of what's happening, yeah. Moses encouraging them, the people grumbling, Caleb um, steps up to say, we definitely should go up and capture the land. We can do it. Yeah. Certainly we can do it. He, he's got faith. He sees it. He's ready for it. And then we see um, Adonai did know their bitterness and lack of trust was not going to be resolved, and he made this declaration. Deuteronomy lets us know a very... Uh, pulling back the curtain yeah. that we don't get in our numbers, yeah. Parsha. When Adam and I heard the tone of your words, he was angry and swore an oath, saying, None of these men of this evil generation will see the good land that I swore to give their fa your fathers. Except for Caleb, he will see it. Yet to him and to his children I will give the Amen. land uh, that he has walked on because he has followed Adam and I wholeheartedly. Adam and I was even angry with me. Yeah. Moses says, on account of saying, you will not enter there either. 
Moses doesn't get to enter the yeah. land either. Joseph, the son of Nun, Joshua. He, Joshua, the son of Nun, he stands before you, will enter there. Encourage him, for he will enable Israel to inherit it. Mm -hmm. Moreover, your little ones, whom you said would be pl become plunder, and your children, who today have no knowledge of good and evil, mm -hmm. they will enter there. To them I will give it, and they will possess it. But as for you... Turn, turn around and journey into the wilderness by the Sea of Reeds. Boy. They have to leave the promised land. Oh, my gosh. This is so depressing. Like you read. <laughs> Deuteronomy lets us know. Listen, it's right with, literally, they've grasped the promises. Yeah. They have the fruit in their hands. Yeah. But their hearts don't come into agreement with what God calls good. And we see what's interesting. I love this, that your children today have no knowledge of good and evil. Yeah. This should always take us back to the garden. Yeah. What did the knowledge of good and evil, yeah. that fruit, give us? Death. Yeah. It, it brought death into us. Why? Because we weren't eating from life. We yeah. weren't eating from the tree of life that brings us knowledge of God and love of God and trust of God. When we look to our own ways and our own carnality and we look to the obstacles and we mm. listen to that snake, we listen to that voice of deception. Yeah. Is God really good? Did God really yeah. say? Can he really provide? And we don't allow to, to transition out of slavery mentality, yeah. not just out of our circumstances, but the mentality of slavery. We eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, That's and right. it produces death in us. Produces death. We want to be the children that don't even know what that is. All we know that the children of the the egg the ones who were delivered all they knew was when the cloud moved they moved when fire moved they moved when god said collect manna that's where your food came. they didn't have a comparison of of the slavery they only knew the goodness of god yeah. that's and how knew, we want to live and they knew faith they, they understood, understood faith. faith they understood there is a supernatural realm it is invisible and we see it and we do it so this passage ends with this kind of discouraging remark from god where he says hey Good news, Caleb, because he's got faith. He's walking in it. By the way, tribe of F, uh, of Judah and J uh, Joshua, my salvation, the one I'm giving salvation to, is going to lead them into the promised land. They're good. And by the way, all your kids are going to get to go, yeah. but all of you, turn around. You're, You're back into it. the land. And so, for us today, the takeaway for us needs to be: let's be children of faith. Let's be children of good not evil let's not eat from that tree let's stay to the good what is the good the good is the tree of life right. who is good but god himself so stay with god and we'll pick up this story in our other videos and until then we tell you thanks for joining us god bless you and shalom shalom